Boom. We are live. Welcome to welcome to Thursday Night Stock Charts Live. If somebody can give me an audio check, please, I implore you to please do so. I hope everybody had an awesome Christmas, an awesome Hanukkah. Looking forward to a very, very good 2024. And uh, we're going to talk about tonight. I lost, I lost track. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is um, our forecast. What do we think is going to happen in 2024 with the equity market? Uh, we're going to we're going to swerve around uh, what I think are the negatives that are out there, uh, and I'll give you a cursory review of what, what I believe the uh, the setup is for the new trading year. And there are quite a few obstacles that are out there that could really trip this market up in 2024. And some of them you may think are obvious. And those are the ones that are going to be the problem. But it's the ones that aren't necessarily obvious. And that's the one. There's one one event that is coming to uh into play in 2024 that has me very very nervous about the economy in general not just the stock market but the bond market the the, the currency market at least the US dollar wise and we're going to go through all that so uh let's get to it um you may be saying you know Bob did you put on a couple of pounds yeah I did um I was supposed to go in for surgery in January. That is no longer happening. I canceled that because I got a second opinion. Always get a second opinion. I still will ultimately need to have that surgery, uh, but at a later date and a and a procedure that is much more favorable. So uh, 2024 will not be the year for surgery, I think. Uh, we'll see. I'm going on like a specialty treatment for my shoulder. Uh, and I need to get back in the gym. I got my cortisone shot tomorrow. Back in the gym. Back in the gym. And we're doing a dry January. Dry January. No alcohol. And unlike sober October, I did no alcohol. And usually do a lot of exercise and uh, eat right. I did not this year. I did no alcohol, but I, I ate ice cream like an animal. And in anticipation of going in for surgery, I was not going crazy at the gym. And that is why I put on a few pounds. Those are coming off in January. Let's say hello to folks. Uh, Ramon, thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. Franklin. Big big Frank. Big Frank. Uh, Bob and Crow, I posted a few names in members area for your review. Thank you. Uh, I will check them out. So let me make a note because I will forget. Uh, Jody, hello. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, Bob, do you think the indices will stay, stay bullish? Riz, we're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit tonight. Quite a bit. Uh, Denny, welcome, pal. And McNeil, hey, how have you been? I haven't heard you from, from you for a while. Good to hear from you. Mr. Pete, welcome. Okay, uh, I need to do a note to self about Franklin. Symbols. Okay. All right. Um, let's get to it. Let me share my screen before I forget to do it. Oh, look at this. Uh, Ramon, CLSK Ben Mooning. Ben <laughs> That's the first one. I've never heard of that before. Except mooning, you know, you drop your pants and you show your butt. Uh, CLSK been mooning after you reviewed the chart. Would like an update on that one at the end of the stream. CLSK, CLSK. Okay, you got it. Um, BB Bean, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you too as well. Thank you. Paul, happy new year to you too, my friend. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good year. Positive mental attitude, PMA, positive mental attitude. Let me share my screen. 
And we will be playing some audio today, so I'll make sure that the sound is on. And we are sharing screens. Okay, good. So <clears throat> let's get it, let's just walk through um the weeks really quick. Not much happened this week in terms of economic data. Uh, initial jobless claims came in a little bit hotter than was expected. Uh, that's understandable. You know, you had Christmas season that's over. A lot of layoffs occurred in retail. So I'm sure that'll get magnified next week. Uh, retail inventories, they're declining. That is technically inflationary because they don't need to mark down their products anymore to drive out a clear out product. So inventories are shrinking. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. I don't, I, I've never heard of the Chicago Business Barometer. So unless they renamed uh, the Chicago uh, Manufacturing Index, but uh, I don't think so. I've never heard of that before. But it's given me a 50. That's a sign of contraction. Uh, any read below 50 is a sign of contraction. We are currently at 50, which is expansion. Or well, that's the expectation. That's the forecast. So... I don't want to talk about that too much. It's really not important. Let's move on. So as we proceed into the new year, we need to appreciate, we need to take a step back and say, okay, uh, how are valuations? Now, valuations on a rear view mirror basis are very, very extended. 32 spot 36. Now, you could say, well, on a forward-looking basis, how are they looking on a five-year, 10-year average? They're expensive. They're above the average on a five-year, 10-year average on a forward-looking basis. So equities, no matter how you slice them, are extended. So and in January, guess what? New earnings season comes out, and you know we're going into that earnings season where we are priced for perfection. Now, if we get... Uh, positive news, well, then we're going up higher. Uh, if we get negative news, well, there's a long way to drop. So uh, just be aware of where we're at in terms of valuations. We are expensive on a rearview mirror basis and on a forward-looking basis. Now, the Federal Reserve, this comes out, this is their balance sheet, comes out This is on Thursday evenings. And this is as of yesterday. They continue to drop a lot of debt off of their balance sheet. So we're still very, very extended beyond where we began the COVID era at. A lot of debt still on their balance sheet, but we're well off the highs. So my attitude towards this and what they're doing is that they cannot hope to get all the way back down to the pre-COVID levels anytime soon because the that tightening, that that uh, lack of buying of treasuries by the Federal Reserve, that uh, selling into the open market of treasuries uh, is technically a tightening on the on the market, on the uh, on our our borrowing power. At some point in time, the Federal Reserve is going to need to step back in and be the buyer of last resort of our treasuries yet again. They're going to monetize our debt again. So the way I view this is that it's a good thing, yeah, but what are they doing? What are they prepping for? They're prepping for the next event. How do we know there's going to be a next event? It's simple. The markets are already telling us that. How do they tell us that? This is the CME FedWatch tool. Now, the FedWatch tool going out and into, forget about January, going out and into as soon as March, only three short months away, an 88.3% probability of an ease. So if all is right in the, with the world, the economy is going gangbusters as per the Atlanta Fed, all our politicians are telling us how great Bidenomics is, then why do they need to cut rates? Why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you stay the course if the markets have not been reacting negatively to 
a, a, a pause in interest rate cuts. Why do you, excuse me, a pause in interest rate hikes? Why do you need to cut rates? What's the problem? And this only gets worse when you go out and into May. This is wrong. This is not 13.4. This gets screwed up sometimes. Let's we'll go out into June. June is showing 100% probability of a rate cut. May is probably around 90% probability of a rate cut. This sometimes gets uh, skewed. So they're projecting out for the remainder of, at least at last look, the remainder of 24, ease, July, September, ease, November, ease, December, ease. So a lot of rate cuts getting priced into 2024. What's the problem? <laughs> These market participants who do this survey, they, they understand there's something very, very wrong out there. Maybe they know what it is, uh, but they're probably seeing it in their businesses. And uh, it's being reflected on the CME FedWatch tool. And the Federal Reserve never disappoints this chart. Never. Not under Jay Powell. Never, ever once. So that's a concern. That being said, taking a look at the S&P 500 monthly view, not a weekly view this week. We're looking at the macro. We're looking at the battlefield from a 100,000 foot view. What are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing all time record highs on the S&P 500. We're going to go with the Dow Jones. We're going to go with the Qs. We're going to go with the small caps in a few minutes. But for just to, to begin this conversation, the path of least resistance for the equity market, no matter how you slice it, is to the upside as we enter 2024. And the probability of us continue higher is only uh, magnified by the fact that we have no overhead supply. We have no sellers of like mind above looking to get made whole. We have clear blue skies. No overhead supply. That is, that's a bull's heaven. So money is in all probability going to continue to roll into the market. You had tax law selling uh, 30, 60 days ago. They're going to be buying those stocks back at the beginning of January. First two weeks, we're going to go over this in a moment. First two weeks of January are typically strong. The month of January, 50-50 to the upside on the S&P 500 over 19 years or so. So by and large, it's not a bullish month, but the first two weeks of January are in fact bullish. So I am predicting new yearly higher highs, not a, not a major uh, high risk pred prediction for me. I am predicting new yearly higher highs in January. Now, that takes us often into the what ifs. You know what? What are what are our risks that are associated with putting capital to work in 2024? And again, some of them we've spoken about here quite a bit on a consistent basis. Others not so much on a consistent basis because a lot of it can be construed as political, and some people get turned off because they think I'm being um, I'm being political. I'm not. I'm just speaking the facts as I see them. And if that bothers people, you know, sign off now. Uh, but I, I'm going to speak the facts. That's what I'm known for is saying the truth, saying what I think. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So damn the torpedoes. We move forward. Now, the not so uh, not so concerning or not so controversial topics that are out there that could really damage the market is the bank bailout fund usage. We began in March. Remember, we had that big correction in March. March uh, that was due to the regional banks, and this usage of this fund from the Federal Reserve has been going straight up. It's not fixed. It's been covered up by the Federal Reserve. They're quietly bailing out the banks. They're they're extending them a lifeline. Will that continue? I predict yes, it will continue. Why? Stick around. I'll tell you why.
commercial real estate. Again, we've spoken about this ad nauseum. This downtown San Francisco office building will hit the market at a 50% discount. Think about it. We've gone many over many stories about these buildings that are coming on the market. Deutsche Bank was the last one we spoke about. And that one, uh, they, they, they sold it off. Huge loss. Uh, other, other REITs are just turning in the keys to the regional banks. And even have the money center banks that are out there that are on the hook for these loans as well. And it's probably only going to get worse. Will that tank the market this year? I don't think so. Higher delinquencies. The strength of the large banks continues to mask the weakness of small banks. Delinquency rates on credit card debt at small banks just hit 7.5%. That is 200 basis points higher than the delinquency rates seen back in 2008. It is even 50%, 50 basis points higher than the delinquency rates seen at large banks in 2008. Since the Federal, Federal Reserve started raising rates, delinquency rates have more than doubled at both the small and large banks. Add to that, you have um, you have an EV crisis that are out there. You have EVs they can't give away in the in the in the in the uh, used market. Uh, the 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 resale value of, of especially Teslas are is dropping like a rock. Why? Tesla cut prices a number of times in 2023 on their new cars. What did that do? It cascaded down to their used cars. Why are you going to buy a used Tesla when you can get a new one with no battery concerns, no maintenance concerns for a few thousand more? Simple. Uh, you take a look at over in China, they have a desert, a desert loaded with EVs they can't get rid of. So that's going to be a problem for 2024 and beyond. Will it take down the market? No. It may take it down a couple of stocks, but not the market. I posted a lot, especially in the members area, about the Red Sea. Uh, they, they finally uh, sank a, an Israeli-owned vehicle, partially-owned uh, vehicle, uh, vessel, uh, in, um, in the Indian Ocean. Well, the Red Sea, I'm sorry, Red Sea. And what that's doing is forcing a lot of shippers to have to go around the Cape of Good Hope. That's below South Africa. The reason why you have the Suez Canal is because they wanted to avoid going around the Cape of Good Hope. So what this is, this is inflationary. So what it's doing is it's delaying product deliveries because they need to go around the Cape of Good Hope. It's taking capacity offline for shippers. What does that mean? Well, the goods that were supposed to make it over from China to the United States, well, there's going to be a lag now so that so that supply chain issue is, again, this time not the Chinese fault, but again, going to be a problem going into 2024. And I don't think this has been factored in yet by the market because we've had two seasonally favorable uh, weeks, which are traditionally light. Anybody that's taking a look at this market this week, last week, could easily see that uh, this, is, this is a market that's being driven by algorithms, computers. And they're just keeping everything in check. It's like ping pong. Doot, doot. Very, very light volume. This is going to become a problem. Why? Inflation. Will this take down the market? <clears throat> this could. If this escalates any further, this could uh, be a problem for the market. So... This is one of my top concerns going into the new year. At some point in time, we're going to just carpet bomb Yemen, and then it won't be a problem anymore. But uh, in the short term, this could be a problem. And I don't think the markets have factored it in. And some people say, you know, you know what, the markets always look ahead. They know. No. If you ever read the book, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, uh, uh, Larry Livingston, he read about the San Francisco earthquake. Remember, 
they had telegraphs back then, but they didn't have much else to to signal uh, harsh events that may be coming down the pike. So Larry Livingston expected after he got the wire that there was a, a huge San Francisco level San Francisco uh, that there would be a major correction in the stock market. He went into work looking to short stocks. What did, what did stocks do? They went up. He shorted. They continue to go up. He shorted. Finally, Wall Street got the message that oh Jesus Mary and Josephs. There's no more San Francisco. And down it went. So I think that the markets are not reacting to this because the big boys are simply not around to place their bets. They will be back next week. Now, now we're going to get into the more sensitive topics that some people just can't handle. If you're going to be a trader, you need to look at both sides of the coin. Republican, conservative, unicide. Forget if you're wrapped up in that blanket of I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, you know, you're out of your mind. I'm sorry. You're out of your mind. Nobody's got your back. You have your back. That's it. That is it. None of these uniparty lizard people have your back. So now we go into politics. And we're going to talk about how popular, unpopular Joe Biden is. And this matters. Now, this is not broken out, to be fair to Joe Biden. This is not broken out by party. This is an all-in view of Republicans, Democrats, independents. So that's why his disapproval number is so high. But it's very high relative to other presidents. So 55 spot, 4% of the electorate do not like him. And I'm not a believer in all these polls being accurate. I think that this is being under, this is underestimating the dislike that people have for Joe Biden. So why does this matter to the equity market? Let me continue. For the holidays, Joe Biden Biden is vacationing in St. Croix, home of the founder of the media company that controls content distribution for 800 media companies, including the AP, BBC, and ESPN. So good old average Joe who rode the train home every night from Congress uh, is not living the, the, the lifestyle of your average blue-collar worker that he always professes to be, good old Uncle Joe. We continue. Looking at the productivity growth versus wage growth in this country since, I believe this is 19, oh, actually 1948. So you could see that from 1948 to around 1971, you had a pretty tight correlation. In fact, let's go beyond that to 1978 to 1980, a pretty tight correlation between productivity and wage growth. If you produced more, you got paid more. If you produced less, you got paid less. Makes sense. Meritocracy, it's what made this country great. That all changed in the mid-80s, where we went from a manufacturing country, we went to a uh, a services economy, less margins and less compensation. And if you have less margins, you can't afford to people pay have people pay more if you want margin expansion. So productivity went gangbusters after, say, 1982. And that was the beginning of the great bull market, which we're seeing continue to this day. And wage growth has hardly kept up. I mean, talk about a divergence here. Uh, at certain points, we have diverged. So this is Wall Street has become popular. 401k plans replaced the pension. All of these companies had a focus on going from focusing on ju not just their, uh, their, their employees, the the employees got left to the wayside in focus, uh, focusing in on the fact that now they really had to cater to 
their shareholders. For a long time, it was more geared towards the employees. Then it went to a shareholder base. And then you have quarterly uh, earnings events that now are on CNBC, and it's like uh, a ball game, you know, after the bell or during earnings season. So all this scrutiny on corporate America and tightening margins, well, uh, the, it's the worker who paid for it. Add to that, you have the top 1% now have more wealth than the middle class combined. Think about that. Think about that. The top 1% has more wealth than the middle class combined, and it's only getting worse. And you got to remember these two charts here. This one and this one, because I'm going to come back to this, because they matter. Moving on. Here's a video I want to play for you. This is a this is a uh, a, a joke an AI thing, but this is one of my favorite lizard peoples to hate. Take a listen. Make sure the sound is up here. I'm here in Dubai, and of course I flew in on my private jet. Uh, very very important meeting. Uh, the issue of you peasants eating bugs uh, will be discussed at length. Uh, that's never gotten the attention it deserves. Um, the issue of COVID-19 not killing off enough poor people and my vaccines not weeding out the rest of you bastards, which is a tragedy, of course. We'll talk about using killer robots next. Um, Chat absolutely solved that problem. I'm here. Okay, so... Uh... That's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of truth in there. I continue. I'm going to simplify another conspiracy for you once again. Okay, so let's say you're BlackRock. You're in control of 40% of the investable assets globally. You're heavily invested in literally every aspect of life. The food industry, medical industry, weapon industry, transportation, the media, everything. By the way, this isn't a conspiracy. This is public data that anyone can find. So once you have all this power, you need to increase demand in order to keep the economy going. What are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna create a crisis because you cannot have a $90 billion weapon industry without a war. You cannot have demand for green energy without a climate crisis. You cannot sell a vaccine without a pandemic and you cannot create media traffic without drama. It's an entire ecosystem controlled from the upper class and it's no coincidence we're in a perpetual state of crisis. Okay, so again, we're going to harken back to this chart here. These people have to have control. And what, while they value their control and they value the fact that they are, they love being the elites, they love being called the elites. I like to call them parasites, but they worry, they hate us. They hate us because. They know they're they know that people are waking up and they're aware of the fact that hey, we're getting robbed as measured by the fact that productivity growth has been ripping through the ceiling, yet wage growth is declining and people are in debt with inflation only moving up higher. Another video. Sorry to hit you with all these, but you got it's best to hear it from their voices rather than me trying to articulate because they're telling you what they want to do and they're doing it. We now have, now have a European Green Deal as a centerpiece of our economy and unmatched in ambition. We have set the path for digital transition to become global pioneers in online rights. We have the historic next generation EU combining 800 billion euros of investment and reform and creating decent jobs for today and tomorrow. We have set the building blocks for a health union, helping to vaccinate an entire continent and large parts of the world. We now have now. All right, so who this is, is uh, EU Commissioner 
Ursula von Delane. She's not an insignificant person. This is not a a, uh, a a left wing nut. This 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 person's for real and has a lot of power. And this online bill of rights, what it means is that uh, they always veil their wants in a title of something that sounds oh very very reasonable. Online bill of rights. And basically, what it means is you have no rights. They want to know who you are, no anonymity, and God forbid you say something wrong, that you hurt somebody, you're going to be held accountable. That's their online bill of rights. In Britain, you need to be able to hand your phone over to the police, give them your password, or you will be arrested. If you have a meme that is on that phone that could be deemed to be hurtful, you can be arrested. This is not something that's planned. It's something something that's happening as we speak. So she just mentioned the fact that a uh, global climate crisis or whatever she put it into it, that uh, they're going to be able to handle this. They're going to be able to, they, they can't stop the Houthi rebels from shooting missiles into the Red Sea, yet they're going to solve a climate crisis that doesn't exist. This is going to make this is going to make the the COVID grift look bigger than anything that could possibly be imagined. And they're looking at $66 trillion in terms of a price tag to fix something that doesn't exist. Take a look at, this is a survey over the past 10,000 years. They will never talk about anything beyond 200,000 years ago. Some number like that. They will never go back this far because it doesn't fit the narrative, and they don't want people talking about it. So here we are here relative to warming in prior peaks in Greenland of all places. Greenland is a sheet of ice. It might as well be a glacier. Yet on a relative basis, we are nowhere near where we have been over the past 10,000 years. I think I said... 200,000 years, maybe it's 200 years ago, or 2,000 years ago, something like that. Um, here's another one. I follow this stuff all the time. I'm going to go to the next slide in a moment, and this knocked my socks off. But let's first hear her. This is real time. This is just out. The digital euro is on the move. Yesterday... The Governing Council of the ECB approved the opening of the preparation phase. It will be a journey and we will walk the journey together with the legislator. All European institutions will be involved to make sure that Europe is equipped with the currency of the future. Cash is here to stay. You will have all options. Cash and digital cash. So what does it mean for you? For consumers, it would be free and easy to use everywhere in the euro area. All of that, of course, is subject to the legislative process. Cash or digital, the choice will be yours. The digital... Okay, so that is a lie. Uh... They want you to believe that you have a choice, but in the EU, you're only allowed to have, uh, I don't know if this is at current or planned, uh, 300 euros to spend in cash. You know, fact check me on the exact number and if it's in, pre if it's in place now or planned, but it's, you have very, very tight limits on the amount of cash you're allowed to use for a transaction over in the EU. And that will be phased out. This is just to get you feeling warm and fuzzy that, oh, I'll still be able to use cash. Not a big problem. That'll let, the, she keeps mentioning the legislatures over there uh, because they want to get, they want to get reelected. The EU the members, they're not even elected. They're just appointed. So this is coming down the pike. And the pressure is going to be on the Federal Reserve here in the United States. This is the Chair Powell of the EU, the ECB, European Central Bank. So this is not an insignificant person. We move on. So this is Christine Lagarde.
Christine Lagarde. What do we know about Christine Lagarde? I didn't know this until this morning. Christine Lagarde avoids jail, keeps job after guilty verdict in negligence trial. They could have sent her to prison for what she was convicted with. She was doing payouts for to somebody. It doesn't matter. They found her guilty for a, 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 a felony. Yet this is the one, this criminal, this criminal, literal criminal, is rolling out a European central bank digital currency. That should sh- set shivers down the spines of our European viewers out there. It doesn't make me feel much better. Because I love going over to Europe, and I know it's coming here. Another quick 40 seconds here. I think this is the last one. But this is this is about Canada now. And I love Peter St. Ange because he's very articulate. Universal basic income is coming to Canada. Will the U.S. be next? I've been warning of a UBI, universal basic income, for a while now, since that is where we are in the fall of Rome sequence. Recently, Canada's left-wing liberals proposed just such a scheme, dubbed the, quote, guaranteed livable basic income. Lest one think it's just the liberals who've gone mad, Canada's Conservative Party deputy leader then spoke warmly of it, saying conservatives should, quote, own it. So, in all likelihood, it's coming. First off, what is a UBI? The idea is to give everybody just enough to get by whether or not they work. Okay, that's really enough. So, and I'll share this out if you want to listen to the whole thing. But it's about three minutes long. Supporters. So, basically, they're going to hand out stimmy checks again. They're going to do stimmy checks. I'm going to put this in the in the uh, comment box if you want to view it at your leisure. They're going to give out stimmy checks yet again in Canada. Uh, so you may be saying, no, you know, the Conservative Party over there, they're going to block this. No, 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 no. I think he, this actually, I think he actually says this on here. Likelihood, it's coming. First off, what is a UBI? The I- no, I'm not going to get through. So you have the Conservative Party now buying into UBI. The, the, the left wing definitely wants it. Now they have the right wing as well, so-called right wing. Uh, this is coming to Canada. So let's go to first the outcome of this, right? The, the outcome is, is simple. It's very, very simple. We already know the outcome. We already did this in 2020. We experimented with this already, and it was a massive, massive failure. Yet they're going to do it again. And we're going to go to the whys in a moment. Here in the United States, it's already begun. It is going to drive up inflation like you have never seen before. The problem for those people that think that this is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, this $2,000 a month, is that it's not going to be adjusted for inflation. So that $2,000 a month is going to drive up for everybody, is going to drive up prices. So the buying power of that $2,000 per month is going to go down in value. And what seemed like a great deal, which they're never, ever going to be able to take away, is now going to be an albatross around the Canadian government's head. So why do I think it's coming here to the United States? We'll go to that in a moment. We're coming to the conclusion here, so bear with me. This is big. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger refuses to testify under oath about the Secretary of State's Dominion voting machines. This guy is in big, big trouble. Dominion in big, big trouble, allegedly. This is the Surgeon General out of Florida on the vaccines. Pfizer executive, Pfizer executives will spend, this is a quote, will spend the rest of their lives in jail. Why is he saying that? The I, I was going to bring up the chart. I, I, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here. I really don't want to get into it. But the, the, the vaccine injuries and deaths that are, 
that are coming out are mind boggling uh, globally, globally, but nobody wants to talk about it. Pfizer executives will spend the rest of their lives in jail, said the Florida Surgeon General. When the public learns the truth about the lethal mRNA, lethal mRNA injections, Pfizer executives will be in prison for the rest of their life, according to the Florida Surgeon General. I honestly don't know if we'll ever, if, if, even if we'll even have a Pfizer. I've always said Pfizer and, and uh, Moderna are uninvestable companies. Just as I've said that China, we're going to go to that in a moment, China is uninvestable. So it won't be genuinely appear to be the same, in my opinion. The damages that these vaccines, vaccinations have caused regarding the DNA contamination discovered in mRNA vaccines, Dr. I'm sorry if I'm not saying his name, or Latipo recently stated, unfortunately, this is going to go down as a very sad point in history. So let's do a really quick run through here. Presidential approval ratings down. Corrupt president. The populace pissed off. Lizard person should be in jail. Epstein. Was I here? This one, Vandalaws. I. Uh, Limiting liberties over the EU, the climate grift, digital currencies, Canada, socialism, election fraud, not just in in Georgia, but in Arizona as well. And the mRNA crimes that have been committed, the mandates, the actual abuse of the Nuremberg Code military tribunal stuff. So all of these people are arch criminals. One I just showed you has already been convicted. Who's the only one getting persecuted though? Well, it happens to be the front runner of the Republican Party, Donald Trump. I'm not going to say whether I'm for him or against him. But according to predicted, he's tied with Joe Biden. This does not calculate it, or it does calculate in Robert F. Kennedy. Or excuse me, Robert Kennedy Jr. He is on here. But if you get Nikki Haley and you get Ron DeSantis out of there, I think his numbers are going to jack up considerably higher. Uh, I, my biggest worry here is if Joe Biden drops out and you have Gavin Newsom who is is as crooked as his corkscrew, yet he's going to be able to talk the pants off of half the the nitwit uh, liberals in this country, Marxists in this country. So uh, I worry about him being the running, the the DNC running, uh, uh, DNC nominee to be a little bit more articulate. Now you know why I play videos. So Donald Trump, number one in the Republican Party. Again, 62.5% 62.5% popularity over his top opponents. After the D.C. protests, Trump's approval ratings rise. He's being prosecuted over and over and over again. His popularity is rising. So... What if Joe Biden is the nominee? Well, his approval ratings are dismal. They're probably the lowest of any president. And he's probably going to lose by a long shot. But that means that a lot of these people are going to jail. A lot of people, especially if he nominates Mark uh, uh, Getz, Congressman Getz, I forget what his first name is, uh, as the uh, prosecutor, as, as his lead prosecutor. Uh, 
if he gets a person like that into a position to attack these people, these people know they better leave the country. They better get out because they're going straight to jail. So they can't let this guy win. So if they don't let this guy win, if somehow they're able to bump him off the ticket or bump him off, and don't don't underestimate these people. If they do that, then they have to worry about the people that are sick and tired of this nonsense coming after them. So you have a lot of people that are out there that are worried that either A, if Trump gets back in, their global new world order is going to be thrown off for a few years, or B, those domestic criminals that have prosecuted him, now he's going to be going after them with a vengeance. And they know it. So what will they do? Well, they got to create a crisis. What will that crisis be? I don't know. So my biggest concern going into the new year is definitely, definitely the election. No doubt about it. So buckle up for a very, very volatile 2024, especially the back half. Uh, Jody, I tell my, I tell my kids cars don't make the weather, but they don't believe me. Okay. Are you in UNG? No, I'm not in UNG. That's natural gas ETF. No. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it in a moment though. We, We were all, we all knew nothing at some point. And the phrase that I like to use still to this day is, I don't know what I don't know. So uh, nobody knows everything. So uh, it's good to stay humble. That way you don't get get in trade over your skis. Bob, those people in other countries and people in the USA isn't worried. The USA isn't worried about them. Correct. Uh, why hasn't the SPX made new all-time highs? It has. It has. SPX. Well, you know what? You're right. I don't know. That's just You just brought that to my attention. I look at the spiders. I don't know to answer that question. I just... I just said, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know. That's a great point, though. But the SPY has broken out to new all-time highs. Okay, so I'm not sure, pal. I'm not a great point. I had, I was unaware. I thought we had because I look at the SPY. Okay, so let's get to the monthly charts I want to go over for the new year. And how we're going into the new year. And one thing I want to say here is that I'm not going to give a prediction whether or not we go finish up or down this new year. You know, the the probabilities of us finishing up are far greater than us finishing down. Seasonality in terms of a presidential election year are usually the, the, the stock market is up during an election year. Why? The president buys votes. That's why I believe that a universal basic income is going to be at least thrown out there to to give to the morons out there that just want to lay on that couch. They've already given out loans, which is against the Constitution, loan forgiveness. They didn't go to Congress requesting that money. He's just taking money and, and, and paying off debt for certain college people. And we're paying for it. So in all probability, we're going to finish up on the year because that's just the way it usually works. However, we want to talk about our downside risk, and they're big. They're big. So let's talk about the yield. Yields are probably going lower. On a daily time frame, yields are very, very oversold. They popped today. We've been talking about this with members. And in fact, I want to check out the daily chart for a moment. Yeah, we reversed higher today. So I think we're going to pop going into the new year on yields. Now, we're da- we're down below 4%. So we can get a rally here. Equities could still rally up higher. 
it's when you get above 4%, that's when yields begin to get, oh, those equities begin to get a little bit waffly. Looking at the TLT, uh, running into some resistance here, but this monthly chart is very bullish. Can we get a pullback? Sure. But it looks as though the path of least resistance remains higher for the TLT. Look at this volume. The however here is that you have no overhead supply above. Excuse me. <laughs> you have overhead supply above. You have overhead supply. A lot of sellers who bought, uh, who bought back here looking to get made whole. We had 105 on the TLT. We're probably going to stall there for a couple of months because we stalled there for several months and ultimately failed back in late 22, early 23. Treasury inflation protected securities. Ran out of water. <clears throat> Over here in gold is gold. So you can see how they trade in tandem. We're going to talk gold in a moment. So what the tip market is telling you is that they're concerned about inflation. So while the Federal Reserve is pounding their chest saying, we did it, claim victory, during the lull, they claim victory. However, we have evidence that it's probably going to hook back up. The dollar is our first bit of evidence that uh, inflation is going to pick back up. And it's probably going to be worse than the last time. Why? Why might you say is the dollar influencing inflation? Well, most transactions globally are conducted in U.S. dollars. <clears throat> when we purchase goods from overseas, which we mostly have manufactured overseas, so it's quite a bit, we buy them in U.S. dollars. But if the dollar is declining in value, those goods become more expensive, unless, of course, the counterparty cuts the prices. If there's a high demand for that product, they're not cutting prices. So if the, the dollar was actually rallying, bucking the inflation trend, which didn't make inflation feel as bad as it could. Now, if inflation, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if inflation picks back up, it's going to be a mess. <coughs> Just getting over a cold. I may not be able to make it through. <clears throat> oh, I need more water. <clears throat> the yen. <clears throat> moving up high. <clears throat> God darn it. Of all times. <clears throat> the yen moving up higher versus the dollar. Euro breaking out <clears throat> onto equities now. Volatility at multi-year lows. So the saying goes, <clears throat> when the VIX is low, you got to go. When the VIX is high, you got to buy. We are very, very oversold here on the VIX. So at some point in time, this is going to get resolved to the upside. <clears throat> so... Seasonality is very favorable to the equity markets the first two weeks of January, but they favor the bears in the second <clears throat> second half of January. Folks, I'm going to be right back. Okay. Sorry about that. Ooh. Okay. So so I just I just answered a question. I get thousands of emails a day. Bob, are you wearing pants while on camera? All right, maybe one one every 6 months. 
But uh, yes, so now it's evident that uh, I am wearing pants when I do this recording. So uh, the fact checkers, you got it wrong. Okay, so VIX very oversold. The Dow Transports. So I always call the Dow Transports, and this could be the reason why the SPX hasn't broken out. Why the SPY is broken out and not the SPX, that's a good one. But the transports, the transports, they look like they're ready to make a breakout. And this is a leading indicator. I'll be watching the transports very, very closely in early 24. If we get a breakout on the Dow transports, that is huge. Because that's a sign of growth. The S&P 500. This is not the chart I wanted. I'm going to do a price projection here on the S&P 500. I already did this the other night. Hmm. Maybe it's the SPY I did. <clears throat> monthly, 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 monthly. Where are you okay so s p 500 you can see that on a monthly time frame and this is the spy and not the spx broken out to new all-time record highs so what i would do here is draw your attention to the fact that yes we have broken out on the s p 500 I think that this could quite very well be our new trading channel. And if I'm right, we have a lot more upside to go here. Uh, That does not mean that we don't have a a possibility of some resistance levels above on the S&P 500. Because you need to extrapolate out prior peaks, which may not appear obvious on your charts, but... Play around with the lines and you'll figure them out. That's what Trend Spider does. And we'll go over that in a moment. So the path of least resistance right now for the spiders appears to be to the upside with only one trading day left in the year. And right now we are far more closer to the lower band of support than we are to this upper band of resistance. Now, why? Why are equities looking so bullish, even though they're very expensive. Simple. We went over it at the very beginning. The CME Fed Watch tool is telling us rate cuts to the eye can see in 2024. The problem is this. History has shown that when you get your first rate cut, and they're projecting March to be the first rate cut, That is usually the top in the market for quite a while. Why? It's because one rate cut's not going to undo whatever damage the Federal Reserve is responding to. The market's going to still be in reaction mode. The Fed's going to cut, and they're going to say, okay, is that enough? Stocks still drop. First, they'll rally on the rate cut, then they'll drop. And they'll cut more. And finally, they'll get an equilibrium of Congress spending more money The Fed uh, loading up its balance sheet yet again, being the buyer of a last resort, dropping interest rates, stimulating the economy. Then all of a sudden you start to see the transports start rip. Cyclicals start ripping. What does that mean? We've hit equilibrium. Now we're going to take off. So simply because I'm saying, and this is why I don't want to commit and say, Jesus Christ, no doubt about it, 
I'm a perma bull going into 2024. I'm not. I have a benchmark. I have a tool, a tool which I speak about quite often that I'll be watching very, very closely. We'll go over that in a moment. But the S&P 500 can move up higher. But that first rate cut in March is going to be a problem for the market if they follow through. Why? Because something went wrong. Something went wrong. And they react, they're responding to it to try to fix it, meaning the Federal Reserve and Congress. Dow Jones Industrial Average. I think this looks better than the S&P 500. It's very extended on a daily time frame, folks. I, you know, as I, I, I think that we could see a bullish start to the new year. However, on a daily time frame, equities, equities are pretty overbought on a daily time frame. <clears throat> and in fact, I'll share with you this. The SQQQ, which we sold several weeks ago to avoid a bloodbath, uh, we started nibbling on today. SQQ, SQQQ is a leveraged ETF product which puts you short of the triple Qs. <clears throat> Only nibble, just a nibble. Qs, they're more extended. They've had a, a huge run here relative to the other indices. So while there may be more upside here, uh, I don't know if they're going to outperform the S&P 500, especially if the, uh, the Dow transportation sector breaks out. If they break out, the Dow transportation Dow. Dow transports, that will tell me that, you know what, this is more of a macro play, perhaps even a play on the reindustrialization of the United States. I did a live stream about this several weeks ago. It's on YouTube. <clears throat> and I need to do a follow-up on it. So Qs are looking good. They're extended relative to the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones on a monthly time frame. Momentum, as measured by stochastics, as measured by RSI, still looks very, very favorable. Uh, this is not a macro short simply because I bought a short product today. Does not mean we're going straight down. I suspect that we're going to continue up higher. Again, first two weeks of January, generally seasonally favorable. But we're going to get a correction. And we'll be short into that correction. We're going to cover it. And we'll get long. You know, we're not emotionally involved. Small caps. Probably... One of my most favorite areas, due to the fact that interest rate cuts are on their way. Now, on a daily time frame, is this sector expensive? Is this index ex uh, <clears throat> extended? I'm so sorry about my voice. Yes, it is. But that, that, that pullback is to be bought. Very bullish on the small caps. Look at the volume. Good volume going to the new year. Uh, Short-term, bearish, longer-term, bullish, small caps. The banks. Uh, the banks have done very, very well these past couple of months. I think that we're going to see new all-time highs on the banks because what's been holding the banks back? Bad debt. Their inability to create new loans. Uh, no M&A. But what if the Federal Reserve cuts rates back down again? Well, okay. They could lend out more money. They can rebalance their portfolios of treasuries and they can get right with the world rather than being so loaded up on low yielding debt. That, that's the reason why they haven't broken out with the rest of the market. Uh, they could fix that problem. Uh, that's why you had the regional bank crisis back in March. So that should fix the regional banks if they cut rates enough. <clears throat> Technology. All-time record highs. In the month of December, very strong chart. We're probably going up higher, but I need to point out again, I don't want to be overly bullish and God forbid somebody goes running in tomorrow on due to this podcast and they go by. Look at this setup. This is very extended, very long in the tooth on a short term basis. I wouldn't necessarily short it right now, but I wouldn't be a buyer. I'd be in cash. Housing. 
Housing, I don't think, is going to do a repeat of 2024. I think that the first half of 2024, we're going to get a little bit more upside. But we've already hit this extrapolated out upper band of resistance. We've already hit it. Now we're probably going to do a double top, and we're probably going to correct in housing, the new housing builds, because there's oversupply of new homes. Oh, the other thing is, if the cut rates, inflation picks back up, what happens? Lumber up, copper up. That's going to hurt the home builders. Discretionary names. Uh, lagging, but they're picking up steam. They are breaking out. So I can speak all I want about how dead the consumer is. Buy now, pay later is a real thing that's out there, and it's fueling a lot of consumer debt. Is it going to drop on like a hammer on them? Of course it is. Will the business, will the retailers out there that are using this ultimately get clobbered over the head? Yes, they will. But all they care about is the next earnings conference call. That's it. That's it. So they'll they'll roll the dice. Energy, monthly chart. Uh, I think it goes up. If energy hasn't dropped now in this environment where uh, we have a slowing economy, I don't think it's going to because when they start cutting rates, it may have a decline initially, but ultimately as the economy rebounds, you're going to have, you're going to need energy, you're going to need oil, and they're going to probably be one of the first to rebound. And you can see here the correlation of the energy sector. This is a ratio chart here. Energy sector relative to USO, that's the oil ETF. That has come off quite a bit of late, but it's now beginning to normalize and hook back up. As for natural gas, uh, somebody asked me about natural gas earlier. Uh, after a rough, a real rough November and an early December, a real rough go of it, uh, natural gas has rebounded quite handsomely. And on a monthly time frame, guess what, folks? We've broken out. What a difference a month can make. We have broken out. One trading day left to go. I didn't do oil. Oil. It's pulled back. I think this consolidates. I think it breaks out higher. And this is all inflationary. Uh, uh, Nat gas prices moving up. Uh, oil prices moving up. That's all inflationary. And if they do break this out, and prices are moving up. CPI is moving up yet again into uh, election season. That's when they're going to roll out, or at least put a bit of bait out there that they're going to have unibasic versus, universal basic in income, and they're going to buy votes. <clears throat> emerging markets. Now, I've spoken about emerging markets in two camps, okay? Emerging markets, your traditional... Uh, EEM, uh, that's emerging markets with China included. I said over a year ago, China is uninvestable due to COVID. In fact, I said this during COVID. They are persona non grata. Nobody really, you have a lot of industry leaving China for a reason. Nobody wants Chinese stocks. And this ETF, we own it. I want to add more, is ex-China, no China. I said, this is the place to be. And wow, what a rally it's had relative to the Shanghai Composite Index. Same monthly chart. Shanghai Composite Index, bear market territory, where the rest of the emerging market space is moving up higher. Why is this breaking out?
prices of U.S. equities are too expensive. Two, and most important, emerging market debt is denominated in U.S. dollars. U.S. dollar going down is a tax cut for emerging markets. So these are going up higher. I'm very bullish on emerging markets, especially after whatever event correction we get in 2024, leading to those uh, rate cuts. And I think out of that, out of the ashes rises the phoenix. I think that emerging markets is going to be the place to be. X China. The symbol here is EMXC. Individual countries that are looking good. Brazil looking awesome. Breakout. India looking good. Uh, it's already had a tear. Vietnam, VNM breaking out. Bitcoin. I own it. Dollar cost average into it every single Monday. I think that we're going up to 80,000. Don't know if it's going to be this year, but that's my price target on Bitcoin. And I made that projection way back here uh, during correction mode when I started buying back into it. Uh, I think that we're going up to 80,000 on uh, Bitcoin, especially as the CPI moves up higher. Bitcoin, another ratio chart. Bitcoin versus the S&P 500, pretty tightly correlated. So if I'm bullish on the S&P 500, Bitcoin is a risk asset. I don't believe it to be a store of value yet anyway. Uh, is probably going to move up higher as well. Gold. Make sure this is updated. It is. Uh, new all-time record highs this month. Gold. is It's politically it's political dynamite to have gold moving higher and dollar moving lower. It just shows that the government has failed and it's real time in, in their face. And it's embarrassing for them. So it's not going to, you could tell it's been very, very difficult to break it back out again due to the Comex paper market manipulating gold. But I do think that it's going to break out along with silver. Here is silver. This is a leveraged ETF. Uh, lagging gold. We bought more yesterday. We own it. We added more yesterday on weakness. Now, other names that are out there that we're going to start looking at, uh, CalMain Foods, this is one of the major egg companies out there. Folks, egg prices are going back up yet again, and CalMain Foods is on a tear up over 20% on the month. DBA, this is agriculture. This is not breaking down. This is consolidating. I think that this breaks out. So the picture here that I'm drawing is that you have – the food sector, the energy sector, that are all in uh, tightening phases. They are consolidating. And the longer the consolidation, the greater the validation of any breakout. So what does all that mean if they break out? It means inflation. It means inflation. And the minute they cut rates. In fact, the fact that they pause in an inflationary environment tells you that the Federal Reserve of these United States has surrendered to inflation. Don't listen to the political jargon on CNBC that they beat inflation. They have not. Year over year, inflation is unchanged. They have not defeated inflation. So what are we using to help guide us as our beacon of light through this minefield? Yield curve. Is it any coincidence that for the past two months, the yield curve has again, again begun to invert, meaning shorter dated maturities, in this case, two-year debt, is paying more than longer dated maturities, bonds, in this case, 10-year debt. That's not supposed to be. So as this begins to consolidate and note that we are off. Let me update this. We are off the lows of the month. And once we get a breakout on a monthly chart, if we get a breakout in 2024, uh, then I would be a lot more defensive in the equity markets because history has shown us that once we uninvert on the yield curve, that's when bad things happen. In the stock market, 2000 overlaid here in gray is the <clears throat> is the uh, S&P 500. 
Yield curve steepened. S&P 500 crash. Again, 2007, 2008. Yield curve steepened. Stock market crashed. COVID, again, rinse, wash, repeat. So we'll be watching for this very, very closely. On a weekly time frame, I do want to share with you that on a weekly time frame, we have, that's not what I wanted. We have broken back out on a weekly time frame. So the equity markets have not responded to it because the computers are in charge right now. We'll see what the new year brings. Let's do a couple of, wow, I'm 7.15. Uh, I only have time for a couple of requests. Um, Franklin. Did you mean in the, oh, the members area? I thought you went uh, Slack form. <clears throat> I need to log in there. Bear with me one second, and I will get them. Okay. All right, take a cloud. My man, there he is. Okay, Riot and... Tupperware. Didn't Tupperware go bankrupt? Really quick. On the cues, seasonality. On the month of January, it's up 58% of the time. Taking a look at the weekly view. The first two weeks, very, very favorable. The rest of the month and the first week of February, not so good. So that's why we're beginning to build short positions. Incrementally, not aggressively. S&P 500. And I think this is our price target. 453.39 on the triple Qs. SPY. The first couple of weeks of January, very favorable. The rest of the month, not so great. And this goes back 19 years. Now let's do Riot. <clears throat> Riot ch- blockchain monthly chart uh, breaking out here. Uh, there's usually a correlation between these names and Bitcoin. Bitcoin, I'm bullish on. Therefore, I'm bullish on Riot. Uh, it's trading higher week after week. Nice stretch here. I think that we move up higher on Riot. Resistance level at 1960. You do have some resistance at 1844. Uh, but I think that ultimately this gets resolved to the upside. Monthly chart looking very, very good. With only one month, one day left in the trading month. Very, very favorable. I'm not going to spend too much time on the daily chart. I mean, this is actually the volume was high today and yesterday. So I think what you're looking at here is a uh, consolidation. And we're getting ready for a continuation move up higher. So I like this riot, bullish, Tupperware. I could have sworn they filed for bankruptcy. Maybe it's just a restructuring. Uh, Monthly chart, we're we're basing, we're consolidating. Weekly, again, the best that could be said here is that we're at the apex of a wedge formation. And it looks as though we have very good support below. And you do have some buying going on here, daily view. We got extended. We hit resistance. We pulled back. And I think that overall, if I had to flip a coin, bullish bearish, I'm bullish on Tupperware. But I would just take a look at that, uh, their, their 
financial condition though. <clears throat> Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. All right. Let's take a look at CCL. Carnival Crew Lines for Jody. Uh, a very good month, a very good November. You do have a breakout here. I, I have to say that if they drop yields, I don't know how uh, Carnival does not benefit from that. Unless, of course, this is another pandemic outbreak. Uh, I think that in all probability, it's going to move up higher. So the monthly chart looks good. Nice breakout. Weekly view. Weekly chart went down this week, but I think it's a good thing. It had a nice run. And now all we're doing is consolidating, getting ready for a breakout. Yeah, daily chart, same thing. Uh, I think it's bullish. Okay, folks, my voice is shot. Thank you for being here. We went over late tonight, but thank you for being here. Everybody, have an awesome New Year's Eve. Thank you for being here. Like, subscribe, you know the deal. And I will talk to you in the – actually – no, Sunday night, we're not going live. I will talk to you in the new year. Happy 2024, folks. Have a healthy and a safe one.